Was Adam 130 years old when he fathered Seth? Did Methuselah really live to be 969 years old? Was Noah 600 years old when he finished building the ark? Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin, Reading Between the Lines. In these episodes, instead of reading particular chapters, we will be looking at certain themes and passages that people who read the Bible may have questions about. Today we'll be looking at the ages of many of the figures in the book of Genesis, both before and after the flood. And there are many opinions on how to interpret these lifespans. So how do we go about investigating this question? As always, we'll look at the texts in question from both a historical and theological lens. How were these extreme lifespans understood in the time they were written, and what was their theological meaning, if any? In other words, we'll be talking about this while utilizing faith and reason. And in doing so, we'll be looking at five different theories and talking about their pros and cons. And ultimately, we'll be asking the question, what does this really have to do with my relationship with God? For reference, some of the passages from Genesis that we'll be referring to are the genealogy from Adam to Noah in chapter 5, as well as his final age at the end of chapter 8. We also have the list of descendants from Shem to Abraham in chapter 11. After this, we don't see the lengths of lifespans in most of the genealogies other than the patriarchs and members of their immediate families. And while their lifespans were not as long as those in chapter 5, we do have them living well over 100 years. So why is this even a concern? For those who want to reconcile our understanding of science with faith, it is a reasonable question. Archaeology typically tells us that we are living longer now than generations past, not the other way around. From a biological point of view, humans are not built to live that long. Our cells can only divide and heal a number of times before they stop and begin to die. I'm not a biologist, and people have been studying ways to increase longevity, but most agree that 120 years would pretty much be the cap of how long we can live based on current science, which, interestingly enough, is stated in Genesis 6, 3. Of course, we're talking about a book which features a God who created the world, rains down destruction on said creation, talks to his people, and sends his angels to communicate with them. Who's to say that God could not have allowed them to live for hundreds of years? Of course, God can do whatever he wants with creation, including this. But would God do this? And this brings us to the arguments. So the first group of theories comes from those who would read Genesis from a literal perspective. And so the first theory is that the ages as they are written is exactly how long they lived, hundreds of years. The second theory would be that the ages are correct, but they calculated time differently back then. And so it's an issue of translation. And finally, the third theory is... Well, I'm not saying that it was aliens, but it was aliens. Now, I would not have thought this one, but it's all over the internet, so we will talk about that as well. We'll start with the first argument, that the ages are as they are written. And this comes from a certain understanding of inspiration, saying that the Bible contains no error or contradiction. And so there's really nothing that I could say to dissuade people from this particular point of view. But I will look at some of the merits and the issues with this particular argument. Supporting this idea, there are also other passages in Genesis that speak to why they lived such long lives. Chapter 6, verse 3 is used to bolster this point. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Saying that a person's life would be limited to 120 seems to agree with biology today and acknowledges that they did live longer in the past. Some would suggest that the pure living during the time in Eden allowed humans to live so long and living outside the garden began to contaminate our DNA, and cells eventually could not live that long. A more supernatural point of view following the above verse is that people pre-flood lived longer because they had a greater concentration of the Spirit of God within them, or a stronger connection with God. It was God's decision to limit the lifespan of humans, just as he had scattered the population and confused their language at Babel. In order to challenge this interpretation, one would also have to argue from a biblical and theological point of view. I believe placing these in the context of the rest of Genesis does just that. One of the driving forces in the story of Abraham and Sarah is that he and his wife are too old to have children. They even laugh when God tells them that they would when they are at 90 and 80 respectively. Yet only generations before, people were living well into their hundreds. We are even told that Abraham has six more children after Isaac and lived to be 175 years old. Even Terah, Abraham's father, was 70 when he started having children although we don't know the age of his wife, which would arguably be more important. Still, the two themes don't really seem congruent with each other, that of exceptionally long life and 
the concern regarding them being childless before they reached 100. Also, if we read the lifespans as they are written, Shem, who is Noah's son, and also Abraham's great, 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 great grandfather would have fathered Abraham when he was 100 years old, and he would have still been alive during Abraham's lifetime. Another theory that is not widely held today by scholars, but often mentioned, is that they calculated ages differently than we do today, that perhaps a year meant a month. Many of Israel's dates and feasts were based on the lunar cycle, and while this could be plausible when we look at the ages in chapter 5, there are quite a few problems as we continue into Genesis. There is no evidence that the pre-Israelites or any of their neighbors did this, and there doesn't seem to be any transition or historical evidence of when this would have changed. Also, from Noah to Abraham, we are told that many of those in this list fathered children in their 30s. That doesn't work with months. Even ancient people had a pretty good understanding of what constituted a year, what with the changing of seasons and with their observations of the skies. So now for a bit of fun. Aliens. This theory may not be quite as far-fetched as you might think. Some of this comes from the Book of Enoch, which reads like science fiction. Combined with a number of Sumerian and Mesopotamian myths, and sprinkled with more recent theories that connect the Anunnaki with extraterrestrial beings. The Anunnaki were gods of the Mesopotamian pantheon, many of which were believed to have resided on Earth in early times. Due to the lifespans of Sumerian kings, which are recorded to have lasted tens of thousands of years, some believe that the Anunnaki mated with or shared their DNA with them, creating alien-human hybrids. Some also claim that this was the origin of the stories of the Nephilim and Anakim in the Bible. Honestly, my knowledge of this is limited to a few articles and some YouTube videos, but if you want to know more about it, I have included a link to a video on the Y-Files that speaks to this as well. It's an interesting theory, but is it true? And the argument itself doesn't really make sense. It's kind of like replacing one mythology for another, because you really have to believe the truth of one mythology to get the ages, and then you have to then replace it with a different theory that says that what the first authors wrote was actually not true, because it was true. Another issue is that only a few chapters of Genesis could fit into this alien theory, and then the rest is something else. Or aliens just happen to show up randomly in other parts of the Bible. Alien involvement really doesn't hold up outside of a few select verses, and even then they are taken out of context. However, if you believe that which the ancients thought were gods or angels were actually aliens, this may be the theory for you. So what about the idea that these lifespans were more symbolic than literal? And I've already given a couple of reasons, mostly based on our understanding of biology and science, as to why humans probably would not have lived that long in the past. Also, as I mentioned in the introductory video on Genesis, the first 11 chapters are widely regarded as a type of Jewish mythology that are better understood from a theological perspective and were never meant to be a literal historical account. Another issue is that often the proponents of the literal lifespans theory take this a step further in an attempt to calculate the age of the earth, which leads to the young earth hypothesis. And by young, this assumes that Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day so that the earth itself would only be around 6,000 years old. For context, most scientists believe that the earth is over 4 billion years old and that humans have been around for 2 million years. So what are the arguments for seeing them as symbolic instead? As mentioned, there have been lists of ancient Sumerian kings that were believed to go back to around 1800 BC. Such kings were said to have reigns lasting 28,800, 36,000, or even 43,200 years. Although some had relatively short reigns, like only 140 or 300 years. To note, you will find that those in the ancient alien camp also use these lists as proof of aliens as well. An interesting thing is that these were all round numbers, or base 10 numbers showing them likely to be symbolic. There are many parts of stories and symbols from Mesopotamian cultures that inspired elements of Genesis, so it would not be unsurprising if this idea of exaggerating numbers to highlight significant people also made its way into the genealogies. We have seen many examples of numbers being used symbolically in the Bible, such as 3, 7, 10, and 40, and the reader would have understood their meaning. So were the authors of Genesis also using a type of numerology, like the Sumerians? But you might say, but these numbers are very specific. They're like 905 or 962. So they're not base 10 numbers. But maybe this type of numbering was not as popular with the pre-Israelites as it was with some of the other cultures. And there does seem to be evidence that there was some number system that was used with these ages as well. They all end with 0, 2, 5, 7, or 9. 
but that in itself really doesn't say too much. That's half the numbers. However, it does get more interesting. According to Jim Stump on BioLogos, one option is attaching some significance to the fact that all of the 30 numbers can be expressed as combinations of the two sacred numbers, 60 and 7, in terms of years and months. 60 was culturally significant because it was the number that Babylonian mathematics was based on. The influence of this system is still felt today with our 60 minutes per hour and 60 seconds per minute. And 7, of course, has a prominent place in the biblical symbolism, beginning with the Sabbath. So that when we're told that Methuselah was 187 when he had his son Lamech, we can see that 187 equals 60 plus 60 plus 60 plus 7 years. And then because 60 months equals 5 years, when Adam is said to be 130 years at the birth of his son Seth, that can be expressed as 60 plus 60 years plus 60 plus 60 months. Well, interesting, this does kind of break down the more numbers that you play with, and you have to really use some pretty creative math to make it all work. Although all of the numbers can basically be created by using combinations of 60, 5, and 7. Another thought is that the numbers correspond to the patterns of various celestial bodies and their orbits around the Earth. From the evidence, it does seem like if there was a specific numerology, the deeper meaning has been lost to us through time. Of course, this gets further complicated when we notice that not all manuscripts record the same numbers, and they vary quite differently in the Septuagint, or Greek translation of the Old Testament. Of course, that itself tells us that there was not an agreement on the lifespans of these figures, nor was it considered that important. Finally, there's the question of why people would have lived that long. Because based on our understanding, it would have taken something miraculous for them to have had such outrageous lifespan. Throughout the Bible, and even in Genesis, God tends to work with and through nature. He created it after all, which includes the laws of nature. And while the Lord would interact with humans, he does so usually in the confines of the natural laws he established. Floods, earthquakes, speaking through dreams or messengers that appear as men, or renewed fertility are some of the ways that we have seen God's interaction in Genesis. There certainly are exceptions, but typically with a very good reason. However, there doesn't seem to be a great reason to change our DNA to allow humans to live almost a thousand years. It is an interesting conversation, so I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. And whether you are in the literal or symbolic camp, I think it is important to address the question of why does it matter? What can I take away from this? And I think the question really is important because depending on who you ask, you will have different answers to this. There are certainly those that believe that it is necessary for Christians to have a literal interpretation of the Bible. As you may have guessed, I'm not in that camp, but I certainly don't judge those who are. Or let me clarify, how you understand the scripture and inspiration is between you and God or most likely the faith tradition that you subscribe to. What I do have a problem with are those who judge or condemn those who have a different point of view. Not believing that men live to be 900 years old has no impact on my salvation. It doesn't change my understanding of Christianity or my belief that Jesus suffered, died, and rose from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. Many theologians make a distinction between articles of faith necessary for salvation and particular beliefs. Some of these beliefs may help us on our faith journey while others might actually hinder it. People have rejected the entire Bible because they learned that historically, camels weren't domesticated during the time of the patriarchs. Again, whether or not Abraham had camels doesn't affect my salvation. But some take an all-or-nothing approach. Ultimately, it comes down to a relationship with God, and in this channel, the question is how can we come to that through the sacred scripture? And more importantly, how can we apply such insights to our daily life? Therefore, I don't want to ignore this question. What are the significance of these long lifespans in Genesis? For the early genealogies, we can see that God was very present with his creation. He shared his breath and therefore a part of his divinity with them. Through disobedience, they strayed from God and lost some of that. We are more removed from God, but are still made in his image and do have access to the divine. Also, these early stories did not have a developed understanding of the afterlife. So one's earthly life was really all there was. To live a long life, allowed them to remain longer in God's presence. I think looking at the ages of the patriarchs might give us another clue. Abraham was said to have lived a long life at 175. Methuselah might like to have a word with you. But seriously, this was seen to have been a ripe old age by the time the story was told. Isaac lived to be 180, and his son Jacob is recorded to have been 147 when he died. These were epic figures in the history of Israel, and their age reflect their importance and stature. 
Joseph, who died in Egypt, we are told lived 110 years, which was considered an extremely blessed age in Egyptian mythology. So one might say that their ages were exaggerated in order to amplify the message that they were blessed by God. Christians today don't need to look to old age as a sign of God's blessing. In fact, when we do look at the so-called material blessings in our life, we are often disappointed and can lose sight of what's really important. We believe that we have a much greater promise that lies beyond this life. So if you haven't already, please join me in our study of the book of Genesis. Until then, thank you, and continue reading between the lines.